I'd like to welcome you to the online morning worship service of the Mount Carmel Church. It's great to have you join in with us this morning as we look to the Lord and worship Him through song and through His Word today. And I pray that you have open hearts for what the Lord would have for us. This morning we'll be looking again at our series, Redefined, uh, looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And we're in chapter 7 this morning, so if you have your Bibles near you, uh, please turn to chapter 7. We'll be going there in a few moments. But uh, just a great morning. Beautiful week, hasn't it been? And I hear that we're going to have some warm weather coming up this next week. So we need to be just praising God for our time that we can come and to freely worship uh, through technology, and I just praise God for technology where um, this uh, morning worship service online is going out over Facebook and YouTube, just praising Him for what He has done and how that we can do this and uh, just continue to, to be praying for the Mount Carmel Church. If you don't have a, a church that you're regularly attending, we would love to have you come and be part of the Mount Carmel Church. Our phone number is 814-277-4435, and please call if you have any questions, and we would love to answer those questions, maybe that you have, or just a little bit more about our church, but there are many things that are coming up, and I hope that you watched kind of the announcements prior to our, our service this morning to see some of those, and we just want to, again, encourage you, if you do not have a church family, to to get into a Bible-believing church. And um, if there's not one near you or not one that you're comfortable with near you, uh, please come to the Mount Carmel Church. We're at 3023 Clover Run Road, Mahaffey, Pennsylvania. So we would love to have you come and be part of our, our church and be part of our church family. Let's open our service this morning with a time of, of prayer. Uh, just be, be praying for this nation, be praying for everything that, that, that is around us, be praying for families. I believe there's a, a huge attack on families today. And be praying for, as we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, uh, just kind of looking at our own lives spiritually. And today is a, a part of this uh, Sermon on the Mount that uh, really has a, a big meaning for each and every one of us because I believe we all have fallen into what we'll be looking at this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the continued guidance in our lives. And dear Lord, we just praise you for uh, technology and being able on uh, Wednesday evenings and Sunday mornings to, to bring the word to those that are watching and listening through the means of Facebook and, and YouTube. Dear Lord, we thank you for that. We just pray, dear Lord, for continued guidance. I pray for all those watching and listening today. We don't know who is watching or listening, and, and dear Lord, I, I just praise you that, that, that the lines are open and we can watch or, or listen in this manner. But dear Lord, we just pray for each and every need. We think of so many prayer requests today, and we think even as the Mount Carmel Church, our prayer list, dear Lord, that is, that is large. And uh, dear Lord, help us to be... Uh, warriors. Help us to be prayer warriors for you. Dear Lord, you know each and every need, whether it be a health issue or just a, an answer to prayer or maybe some circumstances in life that, dear Lord, are there. We just uh, want to lift those uh, prayer requests up to you. We also praise you for all that you have done for us and, dear Lord, how that you provided for us. And, dear Lord, the beautiful weather that we've been having, we thank you for that. And also as we can look around us and see all that you have created. We uh, thank you again for everything that we see and how that you have provided for us. We pray for our service this morning that you would continue to, to guide and we pray for open hearts this morning. I pray for clarity of my voice this morning, that it would be clear and dear Lord that as we look at this passage of scripture in, in Matthew chapter 7, as we look at being redefined as Christians, our spiritual lives, you know, sometimes we need kind of a, a redefining of that or an overhaul of that. And dear Lord, help us to be challenged and to look at each one of our lives, but also to be encouraged that no matter where we are, no matter what is taking place in our lives, you are there. And dear Lord, we just thank you for that. We pray for our service this morning and our time together. 
And uh, we just want to praise you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Each and every month we have a, a verse of the month, and this month is Romans chapter, chapter 5 and, and verse 8. So if we would say this together, we'll be using it throughout the month of August. Romans 5, 8. But God commandeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is an encouraging verse to realize that God sent his son to die on a cross for each and every one of us, to be that spotless lamb for us. But that's Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And uh, we will be saying that throughout the month of, of August. So I pray that that is a verse that you'll hide away in your heart. As we start our service this morning, I would like us to sing a hymn this morning, a song this morning. I stand amazed. I stand amazed. And I, I pray, dear Lord, that as we think of that, I pray that each and every one of us would realize and understand what has been done for us. But let's all sing out. If there's someone watching with you, I encourage them to sing out with you. But our song this morning is, I Stand Amazed.
I stand amazed. I hope that you sang along with that. I hope that if someone was watching or listening with you, that you encourage them to also be, be singing along. Because, you know, each and every one of us are sinners. And what Christ did for us is something that we can just say, wow, I am so amazed and I stand amazed at what was done for us. This morning we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, and I've been saying this for a little bit, Matthew chapter 7, we'll be looking at verses 1 through verse 5. In an area in our lives that, uh, if you really think about it, it's, it's something that many of us have done from time to time. And the title of our message this morning is Judge Not. We'll be talking about judging others and what that means in our lives, but there are many times that we kind of judge others, don't we? So this morning I hope that you have your Bibles with you or an app on your phone or your tablet and you're looking there right now to Matthew chapter 7. I'll be reading in just a, a moment uh, verses 1 through 5. As we think about judging others, I thought of a story that I once heard and I, it deals with judging somebody. While waiting for a plane, a woman entered a gift shop to buy herself a magazine. While she was there, she also bought a package, a package of cookies. She then sat down to wait for her plane. Well, a gentleman came over and sat one seat away from her. And he soon opened a package of cookies that was in the seat between them and took out one and began to eat it. Well, the lady became shocked that this stranger would do such a thing. So she immediately reached over to him and took one and ate it out of the package. Not saying anything, the man took another cookie and ate it. And this prompted the woman to do so as well. She took another cookie and that continued on until the cookies were all gone. The man then picked up the cookie, the last cookie, and broke it in two giving her half. He then stood up and he walked away and, and threw the, the package away. By now, the, the woman was completely beside herself. But before she could do anything, they announced that boarding the plane would begin soon. So after boarding, she was still upset until she reached in her purse and found a package of cookies. You know, as we think of this area of judging, and with that in mind, I want us to look at this passage this morning in Matthew chapter 7. As I said, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5, and I'd like you to follow along with me. Because I think all of us in our lives at some point have judged somebody. Maybe it's a first impression that we've judged somebody, or, or maybe like the lady that was getting ready for on the plane, she, she judged somebody by something she thought was happening. But it really wasn't. So look with me in Matthew chapter 7. I'll be reading verses 1 through 5. Judge not that ye may be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye met, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. When Jesus said here in this passage, and I hope that you were following along, said, Judge not. It's important for each and every one of us to understand what he meant. You know, this is not going against all types of judging, nor is it against rightfully discerning between right or wrong. Instead, it's not becoming God's censors. In that day, a censor was a person who had the job of supervising the morals of the community. In that position, they were to find out and and find out other people's faults and be harsh in their criticism of them. They were, they were always going around and criticizing people for the way they were or what was going on. 
And if someone fell short of their expectations, then they would be censored or condemned. You know, today we, we call these people fault finders. Maybe you know of somebody that's a fault finder, or maybe, just maybe, sometime in your life, you have been a fault finder. These are people who always seek out other people's faults, becoming both negative and destructive in their criticism of that person. These are people who always put the worst twist on every situation. Maybe you know a fault finder, as I said, or maybe you yourself are a fault finder. It's very easy to put fault on someone else, isn't it? You know, this type of person reminds me of a church league softball coach who always played. Well, one time he was not only the coach, but he, but he also played. And one time he became so mad with his center fielder's play that he, he pulled him off the field and actually he benched him. And after chewing him out or, or talking to him in, in a disgusted way about his play, the player coach said, I can play better than that, and took his position in center field. Well, as the coach that was also a player went out to center field, the, the first ball that was hit towards him was a grounder that took a bad hop, and it hit him in the mouth, and he began his mouth began to bleed. Well, then the next ball was a high fly that he lost in the sun and hit him right on the forehead. Well, the third ball that came his direction in center field was a hard liner that he missed and went off the end of his glove, and it hit him in the eye. Angrily, when he got back to his, the dugout, he threw his glove down. And he went over to the center fielder that he had pulled from the game, and he said, you've got center field so messed up that even I can't do a thing with it. You know, a fault-finding person is someone who claims both the competence and authority to sit in judgment. You know, when we do this, we make ourselves like God, and those were judging, those that we're judging, we judge as servants in our lives. I want us to remember that we are not God. God is God, and we're not. But the Apostle Paul saw this danger and effectively deals with it. If you turn with me to, to Romans chapter 4, or Romans chapter 14, excuse me, in verse 4. Romans chapter 14, in verse 4, we read this. Romans chapter 14, verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Paul makes it clear that God is the Lord. God is our master and a judge, and it's before him that we must stand. In fact, being a servant of God, Paul didn't even want to judge himself. Because he knew that it was the Lord who would bring to light things that are in his life and hidden things that he would not even look at. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and again verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. We see another passage of scripture that I want us to, to look at here. But verse 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come." who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. And then shall every man have praise of God. That is a great verse for us to think about. You know, we should be careful not to judge someone else because we don't know what goes on inside of them or what has gone in, on inside of them. Nor do we know what they have been through. Or for that matter, what they're going through right at that time. You know, as I was studying this week, I ran across a poem that kind of illustrates this. Let me just say this poem to you. Pray that I don't find fault with man who limps or stumbles along the road. Unless you have worn the shoes he wears or struggled beneath his load. 
There may be tacks in his shoes that hurt, though hidden away from view, or the burden he bears placed on your back might cause you to stumble too. Don't sneer at the man who's down today unless you have felt the blow. The blow that caused his fall or felt the shame that only the fallen know. You may be strong, but still the blows that were his if dealt to you in a self-same way at the self-same time might cause you to stagger too. Don't be too harsh with the man who sins or belts him with words or stone unless you are sure, yet doubly sure, that you have no sins of your own. For you know perhaps if the tempter's voice should whisper as softly to you as it did to him when he went astray, it might cause you to stumble too. It's a little poem that, that I ran across as you think of those words that many times we judge others. And to take the position of judge is to take on the position of God and to take the authority that is His alone and not ours. Only God knows what is truly in the heart and mind of men. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 2. For with what judgment we judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye make, it shall be measured to you again. In the same way that we judge others, we'll be judged. And we need to remember that. That we need to watch who we judge or what we judge. It's something that really we need to think about in our lives because that verse is very clear about what takes place and what is to happen in our lives if we judge. For with what judgment ye judge ye shall be judged also. That is just something to, to really to think about in our lives. In the same way that we judge others, we'll be judged. If we enjoy sitting in the judge's chair, then we shouldn't be too surprised to find ourselves accused and sitting in a defendant's chair. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 2, if you turn there again with me, Romans chapter 2, looking at verse 1, Romans chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doesest the same thing, or, or does the same thing. You know, as we, we think of that, I want us to really understand in the next three verses that we read in our passage this morning, Jesus reveals the hypocrisy of this type of, of judging. In verses 3 through 5 it says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But consider not the beam that is in thy own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat of thy brother's eye. Jesus is saying in these verses, we tend to exaggerate the faults of others while at the same time minimizing our own faults. That word moat or speck is interesting because it means a chip or something that is small and insignificant. You know, Jesus grew up as a carpenter's son, and so this moat or speck that may be in your translation probably means a, a piece of sawdust, which can be extremely irritating when it gets into the eye. Even more, a speck and a plank are made of the same common elements, and that's wood. You know, the only difference between the two is their size. And what this means is that we often see our own faults in others. Therefore, let's stop being so quick to judge someone else because it's usually a huge thing in our own lives, while it's a minor offense in the lives of others. You know, back in the 20th century, an astronomer mapped the landscape of Mars from a giant telescope that he had in Arizona. And in his maps, he charted what he saw as channels and can canals that were there. 
And from what he saw, he concluded that there was intelligent life on Mars that may even be older than humans and was wise, wisely held that way for decades. But since space probes have now landed on Mars, it's been proven that no such channels or canals exist. Well, how could that 20th century astronomer have seen what wasn't there? Well, what was later found that he suffered from a rare eye disease, where he literally saw his own blood vessels in his eyes, and the canals were his, eyes, his own eyes blood vessels. You know, we often see our own faults, and our vision is distorted. You know, this is like what Jesus says. We, we see in others. We see those faults of us and our vision is distorted by our sins. You know, Jesus also isn't saying to mind our own business, although at times it, it really isn't a bad idea to, to mind our own business. Sometimes we get into to things that we shouldn't get into, but rather Jesus is saying we need to deal with our own sin first. And then we'll be able to see more clearly to help others with the problems that they're having in their lives. You know, it doesn't matter how small the speck might be. Any speck in the eye is dangerous and it is painful. You know, if you've ever had a speck in your eye of something, it just feels terrible. I, I at one time had a, a speck in my eye of, of something, you know, maybe I've been weed eating or something along that line. And I've got something in my eye and... That tiny little speck hurts so bad. Or maybe we've, we've had a little bug fly into our eye and it really, really hurts. And a speck like that really doesn't belong in the eye and it can do great damage if left alone. You know, so it is with sin in our lives. No matter how insignificant it may seem to us, it can do some things in our lives. To leave it there and to make no attempt to help remove it is inconsistent with the love we're supposed to have for others. You know, Jesus' plea is not going against all judging or discerning between right and wrong. In fact, such judging, judging is talked about in the Bible. And there's several passages of Scripture in, in the book of Matthew that talk about that. In, in Matthew chapter 7, Verses 15 through 20, we won't take time to read these passages today, but Jesus says we're to, to critically look at the fruit in the lives of those who say they're prophets. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 15 say, Jesus told his disciples to judge those homes and towns by their acceptance of the message, and if found unworthy, they were to shake the dust from off of their feet and giving judgment to that area. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through verse 20 says, Jesus gives us the method by which believers are to judge other believers who sin and refuse to repent, even in the faces of many witnesses. The question that we have, and, and again, as we understand judging, we understand that it's not wrong to go to somebody that is caught up in sin and to get them back on track, or to, to go to them and, and, and talk to them about that. But first, we must take care of the sin in our own lives, because it's far easier many times to look at someone else's sin and say, mine isn't bad, <laughs> look what they're doing. And I think we need to remember that. So as we think about going to somebody, or this area of judging somebody that has fallen away, how do we know when we're judging rightly? How do we know when, when we're doing it as God wants us to do it? Very simple answer to that, by checking the attitude of our own hearts. What does our heart look like? Is the judging done out of despite or malice? Is our judging based on self, making ourselves look better? Is, is the judging done to, to say, boy, they have theirs coming and here it is? Is the judging done out of a sense of getting back at somebody? They got me, so it's my turn now to get them back. Or is the judging done with a self-righteous or superior attitude, much like the Pharisees? Hey, look at me. I am glad I am not like them. 
Or is it done from an attitude of love? Are we concerned? You know, I see in many families today where we need to be willing to, to come alongside of somebody. Put our arm around them. Not in a judging way, but in a way, not confrontational, but in a way that says, hey, there's some things going on that, that I would like to talk to you about. To judge rightly is to lift up God's word rather than our own opinion. Because only God's word can penetrate and has the power to discern what's going on inside a person. In fact, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, if you turn there, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, we want to take a look at, at a passage of Scripture here that talks about this very thing. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God... Let me start over. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. God's Word rightly judges. Discerning what's on our hearts and our minds. When we speak God's Word in love, it will do the work. Not only in our own heart, but also in the heart of others. It will do the judging so we don't have to. What we need to do is to be true to God's Word and speak His Word not our own. We need to allow God to do His work through His Word, knowing that the immediate pain of healing is there. The immediate pain of healing can start and how that it can create a healing in someone's life. When we're judged for our sins, it will hurt. But if we accept God's word upon our hearts, then the pain we experience now will hurt a lot less than if we ignore it and let it grow. You know, God's word can also work as a preventive medicine. You know, when we, we go to the doctor today, we want preventative medicine for things. And maybe, maybe you're taking a vitamin today to prevent some kind of something to take place in your, in your, in your health. Maybe a doctor has said, well, if you take this or take this vitamin, it will help you out. And an early diagnosis many times is the primary step towards treatment and cure of, of a health issue in our lives. And many times as we think about that, as much as we don't like to go to the doctor, regular checkups are needed. How do we get these regular checkups spiritually? We need to daily go to God and His Word. You know, David said it in Psalms chapter 19. Psalms chapter 19. We see a passage of Scripture here, and I want us to look at what David said in Psalms chapter 19 and verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. You know, we should ask God to give us the wisdom in these areas so we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, as Christians... Once we become a Christian, a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. And the Holy Spirit can properly diagnose our problems. And we should be willing to cry out to God the same way that we also see in the Psalms, in Psalms chapter 139. Psalms chapter 139, verses 23 and verse 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, many of us fear this prayer in the same way people are afraid of going to the doctor's office to get a checkup. People don't want to face the truth, and rather than facing reality, they'd rather live in a, a world of fantasy. They'd rather live with a lie and die than to experience hurt and live. You know, as we think of that, we should, in our lives, we should live our lives in God's Word. 
because it judges rightly and fairly. It reminds me of a story that I once heard about an umpire that was umpiring a game for Babe Ruth. And his name, this umpire's name was Babe Pinelli. And he called Babe Ruth out on a strike. Babe Ruth argued about the call and didn't think that it was a strike by any means. And Babe Ruth said, there are 40,000 people here who know that that last one was a ball. It was a ball. You called it wrong. Well, the umpire, Babe Pinelli, replied, Maybe so, but mine is the only opinion that counts. You know, and as Christians, we may be pressed by others to deny God's Word and align ourselves on the more popular side of, of what's going on in, in the worldly side, but God's opinion of life is the only one that counts. I want to just take a moment today to say, do you know Christ is your Savior? Because as we think of decisions in our lives and, and things in our lives, the only decision that is the most important decision that we will ever make in our lives is whether we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior or reject Him. Have you accepted Him today? Today can be that day where right where you are, you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins understanding what was done on the cross by the shed blood, and ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. But we listen to opinions all the time, don't we? And boy, how, how many of us have ever changed things in our lives by an opinion that somebody had? But the only decision and opinion in our life that counts is God's opinion. Howard Hendricks said this, There is no fear of judgment for the man who judges himself according to the Word of God. You know, Jesus in our passage is not condemning criticism. Rather, what he is condemning is when we criticize others and haven't made a comparable criticism of ourselves, taking care of those things in our lives. You know, before we correct others, we should be correcting ourselves. A pastor once said we need to be as critical of ourselves as we often are of others and, a gener and as generous to others as we are to ourselves. You know, we see Jesus said this in, in Matthew chapter 7, looking at verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would, would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law in the prophets. You know, we often think of the golden rule. The golden rule says, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would, would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. How important is it is in our lives to realize the sin in our lives. As we see in these first few verses in Matthew chapter 7 in closing, judge not. Judge not, because we first need to take care of our own lives. And once we've taken care of those, the sin in our own lives, then as we reach out to others and look at God's Word and, and look to somebody maybe that, that has fallen away, we can look at God's Word and use God's Word to direct them back to where they are. But it's so easy today to judge others, isn't it? Isn't it? Or is it to say also, boy, I am glad I'm not as bad as they are. You know, sin is sin, and we need to take care of our own lives first. But judge not. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this passage of Scripture, dear Lord. And as we looked at this passage of Scripture, how it's not talking about judging or helping somebody else out or, or criticizing somebody directly to themselves, not to other people, but to themselves about maybe something they're doing. It's not saying that we shouldn't do that, but first of all, we need to get our own lives straight. We need to be willing before we point fingers at, at somebody to look in our own lives 
because we, as we point our fingers at, at somebody, there are many fingers pointed back towards us. And dear Lord, help us to take care of those areas in our own lives. But help us also, as a Christ follower, to be willing to reach out to others. Be willing to stand on God's Word and be willing to point things out in God's Word once we ourselves are living what your Word says. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our time in your Word. And dear Lord, as we again come to you, we rejoice at who you are and can be in our lives. And help us to allow you to, to be there. You are there. We move from you. But help us to make you first in our lives. And help us to look to you for guidance and direction in all that we do. And dear Lord, as we're praying for those in our families, in our, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, dear Lord, that we have real concern for, help us to lift their name up to you. And dear Lord, to stand on your word. We thank you for this message today. Judge not. And as we look at this in our lives, we just can be praising you that you are there for us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for watching and listening today, and we just want to encourage you, if you don't have a church family, to become part of a Bible-believing church. If you don't have a church family and are looking for a church, we'd love to have you come and be part of the Mount Carmel Church. But I want to thank you for watching and listening today, and may God bless.